This has been an ugly year for biotech. What can I say? Especially as drug prices have been thrust back into the presidential campaign with the latest EpiPen price hike. However, just because the biotech cohort has gone temporarily out of, out of style in that Wall Street fashion show we talk about, that doesn't mean every single biotech stock is in the doghouse. Far from it. Some of them have continued to be excellent outperformers despite the difficult environment. Take Spark Therapeutics and the symbols once. Yeah, uh, that zero, O-N-C-E, once. A company that was created in 2013 via the acquisition of intellectual property rights to certain programs from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, and other institutions. Spark is now developing a developmental stage biotech focused on gene therapy with a stock that's run up more than 30% year to date, not to mention rallying more than 150% since it came public in January 2015. Now, the idea here is that once is developing one-time gene therapies that can fix debilitating genetic diseases via a single course of treatment, hence the dicker once. The company has some therapies in late-stage clinical trials that are designed to treat inherited retinal diseases, a group of rare disorders that can cause blindness, and lately investors have gotten more excited about the prospects for the early-stage hemophilia therapies. Uh, plus, the data here has been pretty darn positive. Oh, and back in June, Spark did a 3.5 million share secondary. It was a, offered at $45 a share, netted the company $128 million, and they now have enough cash to keep running for years, more than enough to get some of these gene therapies onto the market. Plus, if you bought on that secondary, up 30 percent gain in less than three months. Let's check in with Jeff Morazzo. He's the co-founder and CEO of Spark Therapeutics. Find out more about his company and how it's doing. Mr. Morazzo, welcome back to Mad Money. Good to see you. Great to see you. Thank you, Jeff. Have a seat. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm reading a Philadelphia Inquirer article from uh, from Jeff's back from early last month talking about the uh, phase three trial, the experimental gene therapy on herded blindness, and it's pretty darn exciting. You're far along on this. We are. We are. In fact, last year we completed successfully uh, a phase three clinical trial it was the first actually ever uh, pivotal trial that was randomized and controlled for gene therapy in a genetic disease. Um, and and that, that is a significant milestone. And we now are busy uh, preparing and are subst near substantial completion of the first marketing authorization submission that we'd put to the FDA. And we've said we're looking to do that uh, next year. Now, when we spoke last, we didn't know how far it would go. But you did say that it, it literally brings back sight. Well, this, I mean, this is one of the unique things about what we're doing uh, in, in specifically in gene therapy, but, but what Spark in particular, uh, what we've seen in these, in these kids and adults that have been in our trial, actually 93% of them have had a response rate uh, as measured by our primary endpoint, and they're actually gaining aspects of their vision back. So this isn't actually even about arresting it. This is actually improving aspects of sight. And we're doing that, as you said in your lead-in, with a one, potentially one-time treatment. And we're oh. seeing long-lasting benefits. In fact, earlier this summer, uh, we actually published data in The Lancet showing three-year follow-up on some of the earlier trial subjects, showing that their, their benefit that they saw early was still durable after that, that well, third year. I think it's important, Jeff, though, to tell people it's not the, the actual illness you're talking about is not hundreds of thousands of people. It's no. a smaller sample, right, no. that actually yep. have this that works for them. Yeah, that's right. So it is, it is an ultra-rare, ultra-orphan condition. Right. Um, but we think, importantly, and the way we've set out the company, as you said, is we're focusing on applying gene therapy to three different areas of the body. One is the retina, uh, the second is the liver, and the third is the central nervous system. And our goal at a, at a high level was to really prove out the principle in each of those three areas with a first application. We've done that now, importantly, with both the eye, in both the eye, with the phase three results uh, in this form of blindness caused by RPE65 gene mutations. And now, as you said uh, earlier in your lead up as well, we've shown proof of concept data in demonstrating gene therapy in the liver by showing results in hemophilia, which has been a tremendously exciting early data that we've seen this summer. Now, we've, we speak to Bob Marin, their company comes all the time, and they've got something very special in hemophilia. Is that, sure. it, are there enough forms that there's still room for Spark or is that just a competitor? Well, in fact, actually, the, the data that we've released uh, this summer is in a form of hemophilia called hemophilia B. Okay. Uh, Biomarin uh, shared data in a different type called hemophilia A. Right. We're also working in hemophilia A and expect to start a trial um, in that disorder uh, later this year, in fact, uh, in the fourth quarter of this year. But really, one of the things that we've seen in our early data, which is particularly exciting and we think is differentiated, is that, one, we're seeing highly consistent results across the subjects. In fact, all four of the subjects that we disclosed data on um, had a robust response. In fact, so much so that we effectively eliminated the need uh, for any infusions for these people. In fact, 100 infusions would have happened historically for these people, and now they, they effectively uh, eliminated it. Um, and so we've seen consistency. We also have not needed to use steroids, which other trials uh, have required, uh, and that is a big deal. And third, the dose that we're using, because of the optimization we've done to these gene therapy candidates, is anywhere from 40 to 120-fold 
lower than some of the other doses that have been used in other gene therapy trials. Okay, don't you, one of the things that, that, that the country's gripped by, obviously, is, is pricing. Uh, take Gilead. Gilead has, uh, like you, it's a cure, basically, mm -hmm. uh, for hep C. And they can charge a lot of money for it because it's also saved, the, mm -hmm. saved money for the system. But in a populist uprising against pharma, these large numbers that we hear are turning people off. Now, you obviously can't develop a drug for a small subset mm -hmm. and then make $500 off mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. What do we do psychologically? What do we do in the great ethos debate about pricing for something that brings back sight but cost your company a fortune to develop? Well, I mean, I appreciate the question. I think, you know, first of all, it's really obviously for us to talk about specific price for our therapy. We still need to, to make the progress and get approval. But I will say that, that what we're seeing here, I think, has a potential to really change most, if not everything, about the way we think about reimbursement and paying for these therapies. If you just take a step back again, we're talking about, in this, in this therapy, we think we're developing something that has not been seen before. We're both gaining function back in these patients, and we're doing it with a potential one-time treatment that has long-lasting benefits. And and so we as a company are intending to come with solutions and ideas where we're saying, let's think differently about the way we, we contemplate paying for and, and, and reimbursing these types of therapies. And that might mean sharing in the risk. It might mean sharing in the reward and the upside. If we see benefits that are lasting for a very long period of time, how do we actually get uh, the reward for that? And I think we need to come with innovative ideas, and this is the right time, frankly, to do that. Right. And we intend to lead that as Spark. All right, one last question. Uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, obviously, uh, the you know, a big winner here, and they sure. still have a lot of stock, and yep. they've been doing secondaries. I know you don't control what they want to do, but it, theoretically, the stock's up big. At any given time, right, they can say, hey, you know what, well, we want to unload more stock. It's not their job to be to own, I know they have a bunch of other investments. It's not their job to own stock. Is that okay? I mean, well, they'll, they say, listen, we got to sell more? Well, I mean, I would say at a high level, they've been incredibly supportive. I mean, we've done something, I think, unique in the way we formed this company, frankly, together with them and founded it together with them. Uh, they were supportive in both investing their own capital in our Series A, Series B, and our IPO. They actually invested in our initial public offering. Um, and I think it's only sort of wise, I can't speak for them, but I think from my perspective, it's, it's a fair thing for them to diversify and think right. about their portfolio as a whole. So uh, they've been incredibly supportive and are, are the reason, frankly, that we're sitting here with, with the success we've had as a company. Yeah, and just, you know, uh, it, those of us who are from Philadelphia are so proud of that institution. Yeah. It's among the best in the world. That's Jeff Morazzo. He's the co-founder and CEO of Spark Therapeutics, which has been a big winner and deserves to be. Mad Money's back in here, right? Booyah! Jim Cramer here from Mad Money. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Click here to subscribe and get the jump on my exclusives with CEOs, plus market news, investing advice, and a whole lot more.